So they are so critical to the sports industry and and they're like diehard fans, season ticket members since forever. And like for them to not be able to see their team or their player in person is very challenging. So mm -hmm. I figured, I wonder like how fans are adapting to this. So I just went on Instagram live and um, said, hey, this game is on. If you want to talk about it, um, let me know. And it just people started joining the live. And Welcome back to Fearless Narrative, a show that's all about the incredible stories of women who are changing the game, breaking the rules, and pushing through the boundaries to face their fears head on because they are fearless entrepreneurs and creatives, and we love to see it. I am your host, Cortland Jones, and on our show, we go into a deep dive into captivating storytelling and engaging conversations with these incredible women as they share how they are pursuing their passion and shattering glass ceilings along the way. We love that so much. It's so inspiring and so empowering to share these stories with you. And hopefully it will empower you to embrace your own fearless path. Our show is all about feeling the fear and doing it anyway, as well as women supporting women. We love that we need more of that always. So before we get started, don't forget to hit the button to subscribe to our show. We also would love a nice five-star review at the end. <laughs> Without further ado, let's go into a new episode right now. Enjoy the show. Hello, and welcome back to Fearless Narratives. I am your host, Cortland Jones. And joining us today, we have a true powerhouse, Bianca Peart, a sports journalist, educational professional, and founder of Bold and Brilliant Life. As the force behind Hashtag Fans Speak, Bianca engages with fans from WNBA, NFL, and tennis through Instagram Live, discussing their experiences amid the pandemic's challenges. She's had the privilege of hosting sports shows and covering renowned sporting events like the NBA Finals, U.S. Open, Super Bowl, March Madness, and Showtime Championship Boxing. Bianca's latest venture is hosting a TV show for MSG Networks in collaboration with Coinbase to inform viewers on the latest NYC basketball and cryptocurrency news. Bianca, how are you? I'm doing well. I'm so excited to be here. How are you? I am fabulous. Happy to talk to you. <laughs> okay, so I'm dying to know about your origin story. So your journey goes from sports journalism and education, and it blends it seamlessly. Can you share the moments that led you to share and embrace these two passions? You know, that's such an interesting question because these are two areas of my life that have been very pertinent, right? We grow up in the education system. We go to high school. Some of us go to college. Um, and then I happened to play sports growing up. I played basketball, tennis, softball, competitive cheerleading. So these were areas that like I innately are innate in me. And um, th I think that's just kind of how it happened. I, I, I fell into these areas, to be honest. It wasn't like I want to be a sports journalist. Honestly, I wanted to be like a Fortune 500 CEO type situation. Um but, you know, these are areas that were passionate to me. I grew up in a, uh, I was in a predominantly white neighborhood. I was the only one of few black students and my experience in education was fine, but I felt like I was always looked at and it, it kind of made me insecure. Like, am I the good child? Am I good or not? Because there's so many stereotypes. So I just felt like I was a hidden voice. Um, I just wanted to go with the flow growing up and my mom watched the news a lot too. So I think just be seeing a, the news anchor. She's black woman, Renee Chenault Fatah in Philadelphia area. Just seeing her and like knowing I did sports and being in education, I said, hey, let me just, I guess, immerse myself in these fields and see what happens out of it. I love that. It's really funny because as a child, I would, I watched the news a lot too. As a, and I just really hated it because it always gave me bad news. And I drink, it had me dreading the whole day watching the news to see like the bad things in the world. And I always feared the news going forward yeah. in my life. It's interesting because when I watched the news, I wasn't listening. I was just so infatuated to see a Black woman who... She, the best example is Claire Huxtable. She like had like that nice blowout mm -hmm. hair. And I think that inspires like how I wear my hair normally, like a mm -hmm. big, I don't like it flat, I like a big in volume. Um, So she just looked like 
so cool and so so poised and I was like I really like that but in the moment I didn't know I resonated with her um Mm -hmm. so yeah I actually have seen your Instagram and it always seems like you were always in this like poise amazing look all the time and I I really inspired by that because it just feels I can feel your confidence on the on the uh on the court and just like doing you know doing your thing and I just think think you're you're doing a great job and you're glowing in your field I appreciate that because growing up, when I tell you I was so insecure, extremely shy, uh, so doubtful of myself, like, am I good enough because I'm good enough? Or are they looking at me because I'm black and I'm like a problem child? Like, these are serious thoughts I had growing up, unfortunately. And it really uh, stalled my way of thinking, honestly, even after college. So throughout my specifically sports journalism career, that's where I really built in that confidence because I turned on like a Sasha Fierce. I had like a different side. It's like, wait, I like this side. And I'm like, wait a second. I feel like this is who I am. So Mm -hmm. being a sports journalist and being an MC um, allowed me to find myself and really hone in on my energy and again, transfer it because you can't kill energy. You just transfer it. So I'm honored. I think that's one of the most flattering compliments when someone says I'm poised, I have great energy because it took a very long time to feel myself, get to know myself and showcase myself all the time. Mm, I love that. Okay. So hashtag fan speak is a platform that resonates with fans globally. How has this idea come about and what insights have you gained from the authentic conversations you fostered? Yeah. So during the pandemic, uh, there was a period where the sports world, a lot of things were in halt, um, but their conversation, should we bring back NBA, WNBA? And long story short, they ended up creating a bubble where all the players came together in one central location. They literally could not escape to, for safety protocol. Um, and it was the first time fans could not attend events. And if you know sports, like fans are the fuel. They're the reasons why, in my opinion, sports thrive because the fans, they provide tickets, the fans, you know, for the ads, you advertise to all the fans. So they are so critical to the sports industry and and they're like diehard fans, season ticket members since forever. And like for them to not be able to see their team or their player in person is very challenging. So mm-hmm. I figured... I wonder like how fans are adapting to this. So I just went on Instagram live and um, said, Hey, this game is on. If you want to talk about it, um, let me know. And just people started joining the live. And um, what I noticed is that like, not only are fans huge fans of the sport, but they have a great voice and a unique voice to share. So I just like putting people in places and and a platform where they're able to share their voice because I feel like everyone should be heard because growing up, I felt like I was shy. I was closing. And I think it's so important that everyone's voice should be heard. Um, So that's where that came from. I love that. I'm also very shy. So I really think that's amazing to have a platform and where others can really share their voices. And those who are shy actually can hopefully get more inspired and feel more confidence to do that as well, which is really great. As a Courtyard NFL Global Correspondent, you explore diverse fan experiences. Can you share an encounter or insight that illuminated the global fabric of NFL fandom? Well, growing up outside of Philadelphia, um, I grew up as a Philadelphia Eagles fan. And Mm -hmm. when I became a correspondent, it was right after the Eagles won their first ever championship or Super Bowl. It was such a big deal. Um, And the next season they were in London and I happened to be the correspondent in London um, covering the Eagles. It was such a full circle moment, to be honest. And what I loved being in London and just all these global locations, including Mexico City, um, is that obviously the fandom is growing. And while in London, everyone's like a fan of rugby, like, or Mm -hmm. uh, soccer, like the real football, um, Mm -hmm. you know, I think it's a part of the humor, like they they have to put a jab in there, but they're very receptive to the NFL and they're, they're interested, they're intrigued by it. Um, so I think it's a great way to, again, expose that sport um, and, and really cater to those who are familiar with football growing up and who live overseas because we are in more of an interconnected global world where people are living in so many different countries. And um, I think it's neat that, NFL is that touch point to bring people together from all backgrounds, whether you're local from London 
or from Philadelphia, you're just in town so that you can connect with one another, meet with one another, build a relationship with other people, a camaraderie. Um, so I think it's just great, great how sports, specifically the NFL, um, have made these investments and decided to go to these locations. And it was such an honor to watch my Eagles win the game in London against the Jacksonville Jags. But like, again, they just got off their first ever Super Bowl. So it was great to ask questions about, you know, that Super Bowl run, the historic run, um, and so many, so many firsts and, and, and just like a lot of takeaways from that game. So it was really nice to be in a space to be a part of that celebration and report on it. Amazing. I love the NFL. I actually am a Giants fan, even though it is a really hard to be a Giants fan a lot of the time, I will say. And it's it was hard for me to even uh, deal after Manning retired, but I'm pushing through. But my co-host, who's not here because she's unfortunately has has other things to do right now, but she um is also a sports person, but she's more she's a sports fan. She's more into basketball. And I, I wish I had her here today to talk to you because I feel like you and her would have been like connecting on so many different levels and just about sports and it would have been great. But I was an Eagles fan, but then I, I gotta I gotta tell you, I did I did kind of swap because Ooh. I had to I I I'm not gonna tell you why, but, <laughs> but I had to let them go for a certain reason. So but I'm still supporting you for liking them anyway. <laughs> I'm I'm here for I'm here for the support <laughs> anyway. Always. All right. So hosting sports shows and covering major events is thrilling. Can you give us a glimpse into what it's like to be in the midst of the action, reporting on NBA finals, U.S. Open and more? I mean, it's inexplicable, to be honest. Um, because there's so many pieces of the game you can cover, right? You can cover like what's happening in the game, but traditionally there's always an underlying story, whether it's um, someone who was like the underdog, someone who like recovered, came back from an injury or someone who's been on a hot streak. Like for example, Tom Brady, like they say you can't doubt Brady, right? In the playoffs and Super Bowl. So there's just so many different angles and stories to, to delve into, which I think again, allows the fandom, allows the viewers to become more connected to the sport because it's more than just like playing the game. I mean, obviously it's great to play the game, but it's really great to know those people. And again, I'm all about people being seen. As a child, I felt like I wasn't seen. So I just like uplifting stories and showcasing players that people may not know about. Um, like, for example, Jalen Hurts before the Eagles, you know, before he became the Jalen Hurts, like covering mm -hmm. stories on him is just so, um, it means a lot because one, I'm sure they, they, they want that. They want that people to know, learn more about them. And I'm just happy to be in a position where I'm able to help expand that word in, in, in any case possible. Amazing. Okay, so your role at the College Board is also really impactful. How do you approach designing educational programs that empower underrepresented students to excel at interdisciplinary courses? Yes. Yeah, so the College Board, um, I'm sure many know, are familiar like with the SAT exams. They also um, design and administer ad advanced placement courses in which students get college credit in high school and essentially save money while in college because they they opt out of that class. They advance out of those classes. Um, so Growing up in education, all of us, right, you have your subject areas, you have the humanities, the sciences, the English. And like, if you really think about it, the goal is to become an expert in that particular field. Like, it's all about learning the content. Do you know all your history? Do you know all the presidents? Do you know all the wars, right? However, it's very rare, maybe with the exception of English classes, that you learn skills. Like, how do you write a paper? Or how do you develop an evidence-based argument? How do you know if this is a credible source? Just because it's on this platform doesn't mean it's credible. Are you able to verify these sources? Are you able to present on the work that you've pr put together and defend your work in a live presentation and oral defense? So this is kind of what stemmed out of this AP Capstone course program that I oversee, where students learn how to develop interdisciplinary skills, such as academic research skills. Um, they learn how to present and put polished presentations together. Like you don't just like put slides and pictures, that, like there's a story behind it. So these are so critical skills, life, lifelong skills and transferable skills that are so essential. Um, and is not necessarily highlighted 
in the advanced placement world. So that's why we designed it, the first ever project-based learning course in our AP portfolio. Um, and what was so unique is like AP, I think we can all say, um, you kind of envision a certain stereotype, like it's for white people or people with money. Um, but what we've noticed specifically with this course, and, and we've changed, like that's that's not the stereotype, like we've evolved since then. Um, however, with these courses, what we've noticed was such a higher enrollment amongst minorities. Um, so these seminar and research courses that I oversee, we have the highest percentage of Black students and Latino students enrolled in these courses across all of our 39 subjects. Yay. And it's so beautiful, right? Everyone's at the same baseline. You don't have to know everything about history. You don't have to know everything about science. You come in to learn skills. And that's like the, the starting point. Everyone's, everyone's on the same kind of foot. And it's so beautiful because with that, you can cover any topic you wish. So allow students to explore topics that they may have not been able to explore in like a traditional class. Um, something that's really hits home to me um, living in New York. We visit a lot of schools all around the world, but I'll keep it New York, um, specifically in Brooklyn, such a high Caribbean, Afro-Caribbean culture. Yes, I see you. Shout out to Brooklyn. <laughs> right? um, what is so pivotal visiting, visiting these court classrooms? There are students who are like, I didn't, they're like, I just found myself. I didn't know, like, I now know my identity. I know who I am. I know where I come from. I embrace it. There are issues here, but I want to talk about it. Like they become, they just learn more. They feel more um, engaged and more self-started with their learning because it's something they care about. And then it's to the point where they come home, you have conversations while it's over dinner or something like you're going to have real debates with the parents. There's been times when parents <laughs> are like, wait, what's going on? Because why is my child challenging me on these topics? Yeah. But that's what we want. We want to have critical thinkers in the future. We want to have people who are, again, able to challenge because if you see what's been happening around the world, we can just lean in on politics. You know, mm -hmm. there are so many opportunities and talking points to bring into the classroom of like, is this a credible source? Is this correct? Is this a solid evidence-based argument? So it really allows people to stretch outside of like, okay, this is my bio class. This is my calculus class. It allows you to stretch out and be agencies, agent of yourself, advocate for yourself and have those critical and productive conversations with whomever you engage with. So as you can see, I'm extremely passionate about yeah. it. And um, because of the success of these two courses, AP Seminar and AP Research, it has now changed the trajectory of our AP courses that now that we're, first of all, we're now rolling up out an AP African American Studies course. Oh, first yay! Time. 60 plus years of history and because of the work we did in seminar and because again a lot of students were covering uh, topics of the diaspora I think it instilled more hope in the organization that like maybe we should do this um but it's just so powerful and now we're changing uh the design of our courses to be more project-based as opposed to waiting until May and taking that one exam that it determines your whole score I absolutely love all of that I was a kid in school that was afraid of AP classes, <laughs> even though I was, I was a very smart kid, even though I was more into the art side, but I was afraid of AP because it seemed really intense. And when I did do AP, I should have done English, but instead I did history, which was, I, that was not a good idea. But <laughs> being in that class, I was, only, I was the only one, I think out of two students who is Black. And it was really overwhelming. And also I knew that this class was not, not for me, just because I, I was better at English than history. I don't know why I decided to do the other way around. And that's kind of where I was failing. But it just was, I was proud of, proud of me for getting through it and to actually, you know, doing the course. And I did pass it, barely, but I passed it. But I, I definitely do resonate with the whole, you know, feeling this fear of AP or feeling this stigma around it because it it is really real. And I think as Black people, especially it is, there's more of that pressure to do well and to also feel like, you know, we belong in these classes. So that's amazing. Yes. I'm so proud of the growth because now our AP classrooms uh, reflect the population of the school. So if you have like 50% Black students in the school, you're going to see 50% of students in AP classes. Like that's mm -hmm. what we want to see. And that's how it's been growing over the years. And again, this, this program I oversee, AP Capstone has really done a great job of like, 
allowing more people in who might be scared of AP and, and may not know everything about history, but they're kind of interested in like learning how to do research or something. So it's powerful. It is powerful. Amazing. Okay. So serving on the board of St. Hope Leadership Academy is significant. How do you see your educational expertise enriching the lives of students in underprivileged communities? I mean, it's such an honor. I live in Harlem, so it's great to like give back in the area. St. Hope Leadership Academy is one of like the top, and I'm not even saying this, like it's one of the top middle schools um, in, in, in New York City. Um, and it's because of the board members and just the community. Like we are so invested in the students and their success that like, we, we're just so invested in and and being a, a presence and being there physically um changes how students engage or how students feel seen in the classroom so being able to be a part of the board and just make sure that like operations are running right um we're doing the right recruiting methods we're ensuring that we're allowing access to all students um just being an, a guiding hand to ensure that saint hope is set up for success for all students um is such a pleasure to be honest but like the the teachers the the the, the administrators do such a great job like there's not much guidance we need to do as a board. So um, just being a part of a community where everyone's invested is is just huge. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> I just want to say that because I'm just so proud of all you're doing. I think you're just doing a great job in all of your many ventures. And it's just amazing to talk to you and to hear how how much you are doing to change the world. That's just, it's just I'm beaming for you. <laughs> Thank you. That means a lot. <laughs> All right. So balancing multi-hyphenate roles can be intricate. How do you manage to navigate both the sports media industry and the educational landscape with finesse? With finesse? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, this obviously has taken a while for me to essentially juggle like two jobs, maybe three, four jobs. Okay. Um, and what I've noticed Cause at first I was burnt out to be honest. Like I'm working and especially when you had to go in the office, like I'm working a nine to five job then I have to go to Brooklyn, work a game from like five to like 11 PM, come home and do it all over again. Um, it was, it was, I wasn't in the moment. So what I've noticed that has allowed me to shine is ultimately being myself. Um, and again, like this is such a, this is like the biggest, uh, area for me of importance because again the way I grew up I felt like I had to put on different hats when I was in different situations and that's what I was doing in the workplace like I was more calm in the education space but then like at the games I was more I had more energy but I'm like I need to be myself in all spaces so that in itself has uh, removed a lot of stress anxiety because I'm just my authentic self and it's taken me a while to get to that point, to be very honest. Um, but because of that, it's allowed me to feel more free um, and feel more free. And honestly, both roles kind of feed into one another. So it, it kind of works out well. There's a lot of transferable skills. So I do want to ask you more about burnout. What is your best advice for those who are feeling burnout and how to overcome that too? Sleep. Mm. <laughs> And rest. Exactly. I'm telling you, uh, you know, I'm known for being like a homebody or like I always decline going out and then I lose friends because I always reject them. It's a whole yeah. thing. Um, but honestly, like sleep and rest uh, is like the only way to stop burnout. You got to stop doing things. Um, but you just have to lean in on like what you're doing. You have to be in the moment because I feel like we're always on autopilot or we're just moving without realizing where we're going. Um, so for me, I've had a lot of like, I've had a lot of self-talks, like I had a conference meeting with myself, like, all right, Bianca, where are you? Who do you want to be? Do these mm -hmm. things align? What are things that you can take off your plate that does not align with these things? What are things you could do more efficiently? How can you delegate? And that's another thing. Delegating is so huge because I want to be seen as like, I could do it all. I could do it all. But I've had to learn the power of delegating and, and just really honing in on the areas that you thrive the best. And, and take it from there. That was good advice. I personally am also really bad at, at delegating tasks. And I've also worked three to four jobs at a time, one time at, for years. And then now I'm currently working as an entrepreneur, but I'm doing everything myself still. So I'm doing more. That's burning me out. 
<laughs> but I do find rest is crucial. It's not always for me easy to, to do, but um, also I find a lot of peace when I journal and I feel like it also has me getting more organized with that. And then finding rest and just writing things down is also kind of like a mindful practice, which I think is really also a good way for anyone to get out some kind of relief or like kind of like stress out, you know? Yes. And I want to add like how I define rest because right. It's seen as so many things. Like Mm -hmm. initially I was like, just sleep all the time, but that's not necessarily good. Like, yes, you need to catch up and make sure you have balanced sleep, but resting meaning like do things that you enjoy. Cause what I used to do, like, okay, I'm resting, but I'm on my phone, not on social media, but I'm reading articles that I feel like are helpful. Like how, like three ways to do this or 30 hacks to do this. Like because I seek joy in it. But what I've noticed is like, I was still working. I was Mm -hmm. still my brain to like read these articles and like, oh, when I go to work, I can do this, I can do that. So like, I was always on thinking like, even social media technically like is not, for me is not resting because I see something, I get an idea or like Mm -hmm. my brain is still active. So what I've learned to do, it's so harder because I still don't get off my phone, let's be (laughs) real. But nature has been so critical for me, just walking outside. Um, I have a rooftop going on the roof, just being outside, just something about it just clears the mind. And I grew up in the suburbs. So I don't know if it like, it just feels nostalgic, but going outside, getting fresh air um, is helpful. Hmm. Well said. I also need to get out more because I do not leave my house. <laughs> well, good advice. Okay. So Bold and Brilliant Life is empowering career switchers. Can you delve into the ethos behind this community and how it supports individuals embracing new directions? So um, again, because I was juggling so many jobs, well, two worlds, education and sports. And I was stuck because I would explain the work I did at the college board and people would just be like, uh, like they did not react but Mm -hmm. I didn't have to explain anything once I dropped an NBA team name that I worked for they're like oh my gosh and it kind of it bothered me it bothered me to the point it was like I need to be in a role one of my mentors actually said this she said I don't like saying this word but I'm gonna say it she said like you are not in a sexy job and that's why you feel this way (laughs) when people talk Mm -hmm. about education like it's not a sexy role for me Mm -hmm. I think it is but to other people, they f- might think it's boring. So I had to like wrap my head around like, again, who am I? Like be aligned with my own values and not allow the outside chatter to kind of like dictate. But there was a point where it's like, I'm just going to quit at education and go into sports because mm-hmm. like it's cooler and da 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 So um, while Bold and Brilliant covers career switchers, which is something I was aggressively trying to pursue, um, it also embraces multi-hyphenates, people who work... Uh, multiple jobs at once, which is me. Like, so it's a community to help people, one, feel like they can do whatever they set their minds to, whether you want to switch careers, whether you want to be in a nurse in the daytime and a bartender at the nighttime, like we're a space where no judgment, Mm -hmm. however you want to navigate your career, we're here to support. And the goal is just to be bold and brilliant um, and just be our best versions of ourselves. I love that. All right. So bonus question. When was the last time that you felt fearless? A time when you were afraid, but you did it anyway. And then how did it turn out? <laughs> I mean, this morning, <laughs> <laughs> to be very honest, you know, I, the, the MC world, the sporting uh, hosting world is something that I've grown to love and really passionate about, but it's very challenging, you know, In a corporate job, you kind of know the blueprint on how to get a promotion or like how to fit a certain role. But when it comes to the media world and the sports world, it is so uh, non-linear, if you will, or there's not really, there's, it doesn't really make sense. Like you just randomly get a job or, you know, like I can't basically finesse how to figure out how to get to this position, if you will. So it really, like that's and that's where relationships come in that's why I, how i'm still learning to this day um the power of building relationships just genuine relationships um and not like networking relationship because what i was doing is like oh i want to be friends with that person because they work here and that maybe they can help me get this da, 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 da. and that energy 
feeds off. And like, I'll be complaining, like, why am I not getting these opportunities? I know this person. I know that person. Da, da, da. Um, so I had to have a talk with myself and say like, okay, just have genuine relationships, genuine relationships. That's how you can do it. Um, but yes, I mean, remind me of the question again. I went on the, <laughs> the last time that, that you felt fearless. Oh. Yes. The last time I was fearless. So that was this morning. Cause I'll be very honest with the Brooklyn Nets. I've been working there for nearly 10 years, well, over 10 years as the stage manager. And what happens is when you're really great at a position, I think it's harder for someone to see you in a different position. In this case, mm-hmm. me wanting to be a host and filling in as a host. Um, so this preseason, they, they, uh, tested out a whole a set a whole set of hosts during the preseason and I was like wait I I would love to be considered um and I've had the conversations or like all right send the reel but in my head I'm like do I really need to send the like they've seen they know I can do this and I was like do I really want to send the reel I feel like they're making a difficult all these things but it's like let me do the reel and I sent the email I held my breath I said all right here's the email what's for me is for me. Um, so that's the last time I've been fearless. I don't know the outcome of that just yet, but I'm proud of myself for pushing myself because I'm known to just like, oh, it's not for me. Da, 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 uh, da, da. I always doubt. Um, so the second most recent time I've been fearless, which has led me to something is when I was hosting um, the Aces Basketball Classic, it's high school basketball and high school basketball is huge, especially like in New York City. And in my head, I'm like, okay, it's high school. It's really great. But in my head, I didn't really think many people know would be there. But again, you never know who's in the room. So my stage manager happened to be an Eagles fan and and grew (laughs) up, like went to Temple. I know people went to Temple while I went to Penn State. So we built this rapport and I was like, hey, let me know if you ever need any host for any upcoming event. She's like, really? I work the Super Bowl and I work March Madness and I do Big Ten. I was like, great. I would love those opportunities. Like I was just bold. Mm-hmm. And God willing, I had the opportunity to serve as the first ever MC at a Big Ten football championship game last year. Mm-hmm. And I also became the first ever MC at the March Madness East Regional Tournament um, in at Madison Square Garden, Garden, the world's most famous arena. So because I was just like, hey, why not? Yeah, we have that Philly alliance, but like, let me know if I can host something. And it just turned out um, that I showcased my reel again and, and they see my work and it just was a great match. Congratulations. That's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. I did see on your Instagram that you were a part of a celebrity pickleball tournament. Is that correct? I was not a part of a celebrity pickleball tournament. I want to be a part of it. You're part <laughs> of something. You're part of your. You oh, oh, a- oh, yes. Ping pong. Ping yes. pong. Yes, 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 yes. Celebrity okay. ping pong tournament. Yes, I yes, I was a part of that. <laughs> I want to know more about that because I saw it and I was curious to know who was hosting that event and like how it went for you. Yes. Yeah, so shout out to Edgar Burroughs. He um has an, an agency called Hard to Guard Entertainment and he puts on a lot of events for again like celebrities or galas or charities. He's very charitable. Um, so this was an opportunity for celebrities to come together in support of Big Brother Big Sister. Um, and we just had ping pong tournament and it was cool. It was very fun. It's been a while since I played play ping pong, but to even be in a room and be called a celebrity uh, was again, such an honor, <laughs> such an honor. That's a new word for me. Um, <laughs> and again, relationships. I've known Edgar for a while. He's seen me grinding. He's like, at first he was like, I would love for you to host a tournament. I was like, okay, sounds great. And then like a week later, he's like, you know what? No, I want, you need to be a celebrity. I need you in the tournament. I was like, all right, I'm here for it. I'm, I'm excited for it. And it was a great time. The sports community is so small. So it was great to like run into familiar faces, meet new faces again, all for a great cause, which is to support the big brother, big sister franchise. Amazing. I love that so much. All right. So looking ahead, what aspirations do you hold for your impact in sports journalism, education, and empowering multi-hyphenates to embrace bold, brilliant lives? You can never, the sky's the limit. The sky's the limit. I don't think I can even say I have a particular aspiration because I feel like I'm already limiting myself. Mm -hmm. Um, So for me, it's just continuing doing what I'm doing, continue on my self-development work, like 
become more confident, become more pure, have great energy. Like that's, that's where my focus is because once I know I'm centered with myself, opportunities come about. Um, but like, ultimately it would be great to like be a permanent TV host on a show, whether it's in the sports world or not even, not, not even in sports. Cause I did a show with MSG networks and Coinbase talking about cryptocurrency. So I am multifaceted, I have a variety of skills. Um, so doing something TV hosting, um, permanently would be really cool. And, uh, that that's that's where my that's like the next aspiration at this current moment and is there any advice for our audience that you want to share for those who want to follow in your footsteps or those who want to embrace sports or anything you want to give out there today yeah. for advice honestly you just have to be bold and brilliant and that's literally why we've created the bold and brilliant life because we have limited beliefs we the amount of talking we do inside of our heads I don't know the percentage but we talk so much in our heads that like we to the point where we believe it and like we feel that and it's like no if you have an aspiration if something's on your heart follow it if you don't know how to do it figure it out somehow what I've noticed is that we're what I've recognized and we all know this is like we're all humans and we all had to start somewhere so for me I, my best advice is live a bold and brilliant life and you have to start somewhere. You can't start perfect. It's very difficult to start perfect. It's very difficult to end perfect. There's not mm -hmm. perfection. It's progress, right? Mm -hmm. It is putting in the work and just being heads down and focused and tunnel vision on what is on your heart to live a bold and brilliant life. So that's my my piece of advice. Well said. Thank you for that. And then lastly, how can our audience find you? Yes. Yeah, so you can find me anywhere on the internet, um, on social <laughs> media. My handle is my first and last name, which is Bianca Peart, B-I-A-N-C-A-P-E-A-R-T. You can also find me on my website, BiancaPeart.com. Um, and definitely catch me on YouTube. Uh, Bianca Peart is the handle on YouTube because that is where I'm going to really start um, building a community and, and, and just having everything there. Because as you mentioned, I cover a lot of things and I think YouTube is a great place for me to just kind of have it all in one place, share and build a community. So, yeah. I'm excited for you. Thank you for joining me today, Bianca. You have been so fun to talk to and I had a great time with you today. Thank you so much, Cortland. I really enjoyed this. Um, I'm happy to hear a piece some of your story too, growing up in Brooklyn and <laughs> feeling seen and doing your jobs and now an entrepreneur. I'm honestly inspired and I may have to ask you questions about that entrepreneur journey because I might think that's also another step for me, but I'm scared. Hey. Um, so I had to tap into my bold and brilliant lifestyle to figure out if it's right to pursue that and when and how to make that happen. So I'm inspired by you being an entrepreneur and I'm happy to see that you're still sticking with it because I know it's difficult. It's so freaking hard. But yes, I am, I am always here for you to ask, ask me things. If you feel you know you want to, I am always here to guide you as I, as I can. So yeah. anytime. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. <laughs> And that is a wrap. BS Narratives airs every Monday, Wednesdays, and Friday. Thank you for joining us today. You have been an amazing audience and we really love your support. So we also would love for you to give us a nice five-star review. And until next time, stay fearless. <laughs>